recording now. So we are um, recording. So if you remember, as I announced uh, in my newsletter that uh, I will miss Hashem blow the shofar as many times as possible uh, for people to have the opportunity. We blow it uh, at Mincha every day um, and we uh, have it on Zoom if anybody wants to log on. Uh, you might have heard it down the phone on Friday. Uh, I think it came out okay. Uh, but now we'll blow the chauffeur uh, for everybody here. Okay, I hope that came across well on your uh, computer. Uh, I must say I was very impressed. One person noticed my mistake that I made in the newsletter. It was actually somebody in Israel, um, ironically not a member of the shul. Um, <laughs> my math was wrong. I wrote in the newsletter about blowing 12 blasts of the chauffeur. Um, and uh, somebody says, where, where do you have 12 blasts? And I meant to say 10. Some people just right. blow like we just did four. And some people blow a whole set. And when I was thinking in my mind, how much is a whole set? I times, I did four, which we just did, times by three, which is 12. But of course, I forgot when I was thinking and doing it, that the other two sets of chauffeur notes only have three notes in them. You have the tekiya, shavorim, teruah tekiya, because we have the different, we're not sure what the teruah is, so we blow three different types. The shavorim, the teruah, and then the shavorim, teruah together. So when you have Shavar and Teruah together, you have four notes in a section. But the other sections are only three. Tekiah, Teruah, Tekiah is just three. And Tekiah, Shavar and Tekiah is just three. So that makes 10, not 12. So uh, I, I was doing it to test you. Isn't that what everybody says when they make mistakes? Um, so I was glad that somebody pointed that out. Although the most common meaning is that people blow just the four notes. Um, but I was saying, you know, a lot of people, the Chabad and so on, uh, and it brings down here a whole list. My Nite Gavriel Sefer that has all the Minhagim and everything in, uh, which gives a whole list of different types of people who go 12. In fact, it says it, the original Minak Ashkenaz. And this is what they do in Germany. They blow 12 notes morning and evening before, <laughs> uh, after Shacharis and after Mincha. So uh, that's just interesting uh, to note what people do. I want to say a few things about Rosh Hashanah. We've got a few weeks to Rosh Hashanah, and we'll talk uh, either next week or the week after. I want to go through how we ended up with the Rosh Hashanah Machsa that we have, because everyone's talking about, oh, what can we miss out? What can't we miss out? What do we have to say? What don't we have to say? So I want to go through uh, some of the rationale and how we ended up uh, with a Machsa that we have today. But I will say a couple of points. Um, and I, I am going, and I started writing this in my preparing notes for people who are not coming to shul Rosh Hashanah. And that is, quite frankly, if you're not coming to shul, so you have much more time, even though you're coming to shul, you have more time than a regular Rosh Hashanah because you've got more time at home because the davening is going to be quicker. So you have more time to take out the matter and go through some of these Iyotim. Do you have to say them? No, you don't. As long as you daven, you say the Shemona Esra, and you say the Musa. But I don't think it's uh, any problem uh, to take out the Mahsa and spend some time going through these extra liturgical poems, they call them. Um, uh, Piyudim, these extra poems we say in the Chazan's repetition of Shachris and Mosef. So we're talking about things like V'chol Maminim, that I'm sure you all recognize V'chol Maminim and the son of Tokev. These sort of things, it doesn't do any harm. You have all that time to go back. Melech Elyon, some of the things you might remember every year. Melech Elyon and Hashem Melech, Hashem Moloch, Hashem Yimreich, Li'aylam Vayed. These are wonderful poems that get you in the mood. And I have to say, again, I just want to preface this in case anybody thinks I'm uh, encouraging everybody to come to Shul, come what may. That of course, everybody has their own decision to make, to weigh up whether they feel that they want to come, whether the risks for them uh, in whatever area they are, are worth whatever. That's their own decision for themselves to make. However, and this is where uh, I, I feel quite strongly about this. If you think about it, 
if you're not coming to shul, then it's harder for you, and you have to put more effort into the davening than you would do if you come to shul. If you come to shul, you have the inspiration of coming to shul with davening, you have the inspiration of being in a minion, of hearing all the songs and the tunes to inspire you, to get you in the mood, if you like, for Rosh Hashanah, let's use that word, get you in the mood, put you in the zone, right? Get you in the zone for connecting to Hashem, get you in the zone to cry out and pour out your heart to Hashem, which is obviously the whole idea of the Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur davening, to do tshuva, to repent, to appoint or to crown Hashem as our king. That's the whole idea of Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. We'll talk about that more over the next few weeks. So if you're in shul, you've got everybody else, you can feed off the chazan, you can feed off the, the energy in the shul. But if you're at home, and again, and, and don't feel that I'm, I'm saying that you shouldn't be at home, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is if you are at home, I believe you have to work even harder. You have to put in even more effort, even more energy. It's not the time for slacking off and saying, oh yes, well, I'm not going to shul, so uh, I'll read the newspaper or I'll pick up the latest Jane Austen novel. Is that what people read today, Jane Austen? I don't know uh, what people read. Uh, and it's, 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 it's the opposite. If you're staying at home, I believe you need to put in more energy and find more ways of connecting to Hashem. And to that end, you've got a few weeks. You know, I have this expression, if you fail to prepare, you prepare to fail. So now is the time if you want to buy yourself uh, on Amazon or eBay, or whatever sites or Jewish sites that you want, buy yourself. There are loads of Jewish books, loads of English Jewish books that talk about uh, Rosh Hashanah, what it means to talk about the davening. Uh, I have a few of them. There's a book by Oscar called The Days of Awe, uh, which is a, a, a very good book. There's, there's guides to the davening, there's guides to the mazorim, and yes, the shul are going to give out, I believe, we've agreed to allow people to take a machsa, but you may find that you want to get a machsa that has a lot more explanations. If you're at home, you have more time. So now is the time to prepare. In the same way as we'll talk also about sukkahs, people have already started asking me, Shailas, about sukkahs, uh, and where they can build the sukkah, what they can build, so we'll uh, have to go through the halachas of that. That takes time to prepare, to think. Same as with Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur. We're going to come into that uh, as my topic of my Shia tonight. Uh, so I think people should take that message to heart, that just because you're not coming to shul, just because we're not in shul for Elul, or we're not doing slichas or whatever, uh, it's just the opposite. We need to take even more energy uh, to connect to Hasha. And maybe you'll find that by doing all this extra work and, and, and energy, and, and so on, you'll find that it will be a much more meaningful experience. We said this by Pesach, didn't we? We said that yeah, everybody, a lot of people, I'm sure, used to go away for Pesach and hotels and, and so on. And this year, most people had to do it themselves and clean and have their own Seder, sometimes just with two people. But, and a couple of people said to me afterwards, they felt so much more connected to the Seder because they were doing it themselves. They weren't relying on anybody else or sitting in a seder with hundreds of people. They actually had to go and work at it. So maybe that will be the same for Rosh Hashanah. Maybe that will be the same. And I was thinking, because I've been thinking a lot about this, there's many things in the coronavirus. Clearly, there is an idea of a punishment. That's clear. There's an idea of testing. There's an idea, all sorts of ideas are, are, are behind this. Not that I know or I'm going to tell you uh, because I'm not a prophet yet. Uh, and we've discussed prophecy many times here, uh, and so on. Like I've said, if you see me going into a trance, don't wake me up, because it might be me having prophecy. So uh, we've talked about prophecy many times. You can see those shiurim on, on YouTube. But think about it this way. This year, our Judaism was very hard. Our shuls were closed. Rosh Hashanah, even Rosh Hashanah, if we're going to be in Mitz Hashem together, in, in, inside and dabbing together, it's going to be different. There's going to be less people. It's going to be a different type of davening. So many people are going to be home. Lots of people are going to be outside. And I think Hashem is going to look around with a big grin on his face, saying, these are my children. Look what effort. Look what lengths they're going to, to daven to me. Look what lengths they're going to, to do my mitzvahs. I made it so hard for them. I made it so difficult to be able to daven, to come to shul, to do mitzvahs. But yet they're still doing it. The dogs are dabbling outside. We're standing outside. And even when the roof fell in, we're still dabbling on the different side. 
and we're davening in the heat and we're davening with all sorts and we're blowing the shofar in public in front of everybody. I feel like one of these Chabad rabbis, right, who goes and blows the shofar in uh, all these shopping centers and uh, everybody who, who hears it, hears it. We are going the extra mile and I'm sure Hashem has got a big grin on his face with such satisfaction saying, oh, look at my children, they love me so much. They'll do anything just to have a minion. They'll do anything just in a safe, well, of course, of course, I, I, I'm not trying to advocate doing anything against the standard health accepted normal practices of the moment, but I think Hashem will be proud and happy that this is what we are doing, this is what we are achieving on His behalf. So now is the time to start thinking about that. And that leads me on to Elul. We all know we're in the month of Elul. Elul has become over the last, you know, even since I was born, Elul has become much more important, shall we say. I walk around, my wife drives, tells me to shut up all the time. I walk around, that's what we used to do in Yeshiva. Every few minutes I work out blasting, Elul, you know, because you get to the food. And now my son is doing it, uh, Daniel, because he hears me doing it all the time. And my wife is going, look, Zay, not as bad enough, you're doing it, now Daniel's doing it, right? So, you know, people, they get the inspiration, they get so what's it all about? Why does Elul take on such importance? If you look in the Gemara, in the Gemara in Rosh Hashanah, it says very clearly, Hashem Seek out Hashem where He can be found. Talks about the Aserus you made sure for the 10 days of repentance. Those are the special days that any individual finds it easy to do shuva. Hashem gives you the ability, the energy. He's listening, he's close. Talks about the assessment shuva. Assessment shuva, special holy. The Gemara talks about it again and again and again. We know that. That's not the topic for tonight. So where did Elul become so... I'm thinking of a good adjective to, work, to use. When did it become so top-heavy? With, with, with tshuva and repentance and doing mitzvahs and good deeds. Now, of course, you should be doing mitzvahs and good deeds and tshuva every day. Of course, right? That's, that's what we should all be doing. But where did Elul take on this special importance, this special, uh, this special uh, energy? We know Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, but where did Elul come from? What's Elul? Where did it appear? Well, it appears after Av, I suppose, but you, you'll get what I mean. So here, I'm going to quote from the Sefer, the Yisod Rishon Rishon which is a wonderful Sefer to have. It goes through all days of the year. It goes through davenings, tells you what to think, when to think, how to think during davening. And uh, it's in Hebrew. I don't know if they do any English versions of it. There's a lot of Kabbalistic ideas in it, but it's very light, very easy, um, and, and so on. And it tells you the importance, and it goes through certain mitzvahs, right, Shabbos, uh, and what to think, how to think, what to imagine. So it's a wonderful Sefer. So he, in his introduction to Elul, says as follows. I will read it here. I thought I marked the page. Like Mark the Innocent Man. What was that? So Shemar Tom or a Yoshar, yes. God the Upright and Mark the Innocent Man. Which you should all do when you're playing soccer, uh, defending a set piece. You guard the uprights, you stand by the posts, and you mark the Innocent Man but uh, people don't seem to be doing that nowadays, and that's why they let in lots of gold. But you probably don't know what I'm talking about. Um, well, uh, I, have another football, I have another football soccer reference uh, to come at the end of the year in Mitzah Hashem. So, Chodesh Elo, it says like this, The Rishonim, right? That's the people who lived from, what, the 900s, the 10th century to the uh, 16th century. Those are known as the Rishonim. And anybody after that is known as the Achorim. So the Shulchan Aruch was the end of the Rishonim. So the Rambam, Rashi, Tosvas, all these are known as the Rishonim. And then after the Shulchan Aruch, everyone else is the Achorim. The Kiva Eger and uh, the Chazanish and the, the Mishnah Bro. Those are known as Achorim. Those are the later people. And uh, if you're an Achorim, you can't argue on a Rishon. Those are like a higher degree, a higher level, and so on. So it says all these people started Yoat Siman Elo. They give you advice. Al El of Ne Rosh Hashanah. The advice is that you should take heed in El because of Rosh Hashanah. And they scare everybody. Well, scaring might be a strong word, but they impress the importance upon everybody. 
Oyom is all. They make people feel all. Ki Godel Yom Hashem, that the great day of Hashem is coming. Ki Karev Omi Yechilenu. And then he quotes the Tor. The Tor, if you like, is the father of the Shulchan Aruch, not literally the father, but it's the father section. So the Tor went on his pathway, and the Shulchan Aruch follows the section set out by the Tor, but he's much more brief and precise and to the point. So the Tor is like the daddy of halachos, if you, if you have that expression here uh, in this country, right? He's the father. He says like this. <laughs> I suppose the Torah could get the reference on the sharing the screen, but uh, I'm not going to bother with that now. It says, Tanya Bepikir Rebbe Lezer, for Rosh Chodesh Elul, on our Kodesh Baruch Hu, Moshe, Alei Elai Hodor, on Rosh Chodesh Elul, Hashem said to Moshe, come back up the mountain and bring with you the new set of tablets that I'm going to inscribe, that he came down on Yom Kippur with them. Right? So he went up. And they blew a shofar the day he went up. Moshe, everyone shouted, shouting, Moshe has gone up the mountain, he's gone up the mountain, making sure they didn't serve another Egil. Right, goes on. And said, that's why they made a Takana that you should blow the Shofar and Rosh Hashanah in Elul, because they blew the Shofar every day in Elul when Moshe was up the mountain, to say, don't think you can make an Egil again today. Moshe is still at the mountain, don't worry. So it's interesting, they blew the original blowing of the Shofar in Elul was at Moshe Rabbeinu when he was up the mountain. And another reason he says, to warn the Jews to do tshuva. So clearly it's already written in the Torah that Elul is a time of tshuva. It's a time to do tshuva, time to take stock. It's a time to evaluate where we are with our Jewish lives, where we are headed, what course we are on, right? What train we're on. You know, they give the example, you come to a busy station, and uh, there's all these trains. Which train are you going to get onto? Each train goes to a different destination. I remember when I first came to America, very confusing. Because in England, in the underground, you have one train per line. So you don't have multiple trains on the same line going to different destinations. So if you're looking for a train going to one direction or one place, you have to go to that specific line. And you know you can't get on the wrong train. When I first came to America, as you know, and in thing, you can have the A train and the B train and the F train. They all come to the same platform. So even if you get to the right platform, you could still got to make sure you're on the right train because you could get on the train and end up somewhere totally different. It was so confusing I, until I realized that, whoops, you've got to remember not just what platform you're on, you've got to remember what train you're getting on. So it's the same with life. You might be at the same platform. You might be davening in the same shul. But what train are you getting on? He's getting on the train to Shamayim, to heaven. Where are you getting on? What train? Where's your train going to, right? That's the metaphor they give. You've got to analyze and think to yourself, be honest with yourself, which is very, very hard. Uh, there's the famous marshal. I can't remember who was the first one who said it. But all the Sifri Musa and the Mesil uh, uh, the they give the expression... What, how does it go? It's easier to thread, to, uh, to push a camel through the eye of a needle than it is to tra cha change one thing about yourself. The expression is there to teach you that real change of a midah is really, really difficult. And I suppose I started talking about drugs, didn't I, when I talked about user. Little did I know that HaKadosh Baruch was already planting the seeds in my head about drugs. You see, everything comes to HaKadosh Baruch especially when you give me the share, because now I've just thought about using and drugs. You see an analogy of this, where you have addicts and you have alcoholics. For them to really change and to give up, it's so hard, it's so difficult for them to truly change and to truly give up what they're doing. I saw uh, somebody was saying recently that he's an alcoholic and he hasn't had a drink for 28 years. And I thought, well, so we've been on that drink for 28 years. Why, why is he still calling himself an alcoholic? 28 years, right? It's almost as long as I've been alive, right? And then I thought to myself, no, he's still an alcoholic. He always has that in him. But he's able to control himself for 28 years not to have a drink. But he still called himself an alcoholic. I'm an alcoholic. I haven't had a drink for 28 years. And I suppose that's what we have to do as well. We have our middos. We have our traits. We have our things that we are prone to do. 
that Hashem has tested us with, but we have to control it, we have to subdue it, and we have to make sure that we don't let the cat out of the bag on the things that we shouldn't. But it's still there, we have to change, and it's difficult to be honest with ourselves. You know, very difficult to be completely honest with yourself. That's why perhaps it's best if your spouse did it. Right, you ask your spouse, right? Because your spouse will be honest with you, and your spouse certainly knows. And certainly, as a rabbi, I can ask my coven because everybody knows my faults and uh, not afraid to point them out sometimes in a good way, right? You know, and, and so on. You speak too fast, this, so you know, so it's easier for a rabbi to, 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 to know what to change. But in all serious stuff, right? We've got to think to ourselves what's going on? Where are we headed? What can I do differently? How can I live a better Jewish life? How can I be more connected to Hashem? How can I become more Jewish? And I, I often think to myself, and I don't have the answer to this because it's hard to know. I, I, I think to myself regularly, what does Hashem think about me? What does Hashem think about me? So I think I'm amazing, right? Everybody, I, I think I'm amazing. I think I'm doing the best. I'm going to get oil in my ball like you wouldn't believe. I'm going to get the most unbelievable portion. I'm going to get the biggest portion anybody has ever got in oil in my ball. I'm going to get rewarded. I'm going to be so amazing. I think myself, yeah, of course I think that because everybody thinks that. But what does Hashem think, right? What does Hashem, when he sits and talks and looks at me, and he looks at me, what does he think? What does he see? Where, what would he say? It's a difficult question to answer, and I'm certainly not going to answer it to all of you because that's between me and Hashem and my wife. But, uh, you know, so that's between, you know, that's obviously private. But it's important to make a reckoning of where you are headed. And what it goes on to say is we know that Elul is a time of you may rotten, it's a time of great favor from Hashem because Moshe was up the mountain, he was getting good news, they were writing the tablets. Hashem was giving him more mitzvahs. This was a great time. But I think the whole idea goes on to say is, this is a preparation for Rosh Hashanah. We all know Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur Sukkot is a very rushed time, right? It's a very rushed time. You've got running around preparing for Yom Tov, getting your apple and your honey and your pomegranates and your shekhi yana fruit, washing your clothes, which surely you're going to go to. Have you got your seats, right? And, and this year you have all sorts of even more craziness. Then you have Yom Kippur. Do I know what pills I'm taking on Yom Kippur? How am I going to have to have pills? What can I take? What can I not take? Right? We have to get in that mindset. Then it comes to I'm building my sukkah. I'm not building my sukkah. Which, which, which lot of am I getting? I've got to buy my food. I've got to go to Costco. I've got to get there. Yeah. It's a busy time. It's, it's, it's a very rushed time. And it goes so fast. And you're so busy and preoccupied with things. Right? That sometimes it can pass you by without you really thinking, well, okay, that was Rosh Hashanah, that was Yom Kippur, that was Sukkot, oh, right, we're back to Shabbos Parashas again. Oh, okay, so I think this idea of Elul is that you have to take the time now to prepare. Now you have a little bit more Menuchas HaNefesh, now you have a little bit more free time and, 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 and uh, time to, to think before the rush craziness and fear, right? There's a little bit of fear Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, of course there is. The books of life and death are open. Everybody feels a little bit on edge, right? What are we going to get this year? What is Hashem going to give us, right? Especially as we get older and, and so on. Somebody was saying to me the other week, he said, Rabbi, he said, every year comes Rosh Hashanah. He said, I know this guy is, is, is an old guy. I'm not going to tell you how old he is because then you could guess. But he was saying, you know, one of these years, HaKadosh Baruch was going to say to me, no, right? He's not going to put me in the book of life. He says, I know that. He says, I'm old, so of course, I, I have little time left. He said to me, so every year, Rosh Hashanah, he says, I feel it so much more. You know, when you're young, <laughs> right? You think, ah, death, life, death, ah, right, yeah, I'm young. But when you get older, you feel it a bit more. I feel, mm. yes, it's a bit more real for you because you feel it could well be. Maybe, maybe this is the year, Chas Hashanah, maybe, who knows? And Right? It's, it's illnesses and dementia and all these things that people worry about as you get to a certain age group. There's a lot of fear over Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. It's a time of awe. It's a time of, yes, I think people, I think if you, if you ask yourself honestly, yeah, people a little bit on edge, people a little bit, it's one of the reasons we don't do Kiddush Lavana, uh, because you're so on edge, you can't be Masameh, you can't be so happy to dance around with the moon. 
that you can't do Kaddish Levana because you're not in the right frame of mind. I, I'm so preoccupied, I'm nervous, you know. Like you've got a court date, you've got a court date, uh, people being sentenced to life, imprisonment, or to be death penalty. Can you imagine how they feel coming up to the sentencing, right? Nervous, frightened. So Elul is a time that we can have a little bit more menuchas and nefesh, get everything in order, to be able to think honestly, where we have the time to sit out on our porches, right, sit out in the nice windy weather we had today, probably something to do with the offshoots of the hurricane, and to really introspect and find out what we should be doing. But then, something hit me this afternoon, thinking and, and, and preparing to share, something hit me this afternoon, and uh, Hashem put this idea into my head, and uh, I want to share it with you. This idea is, is, is so, when, I, when it came into my head and I thought through it, it can have such powerful ramifications. This week's parasha, or last week's parasha, we learned about the Dinoki Adam Eitz HaSode. You're not allowed to cut down a fruit tree when you come to war, when you're laying siege around the city. You're not allowed to cut down a fruit tree. And the, the Torah says this strange expression, Ki Adam Eitz HaSode, which most people translate as a question. Ki Adam Eitz HaSode, is the tree a man that you're going to kill the tree? Is the, man, is, the, is the tree a man that you're killing in war? Don't harm the tree. What's the tree ever done to you? Right? You need the tree. So we see from there that a man is compared to a tree, which is why we have another din, also in this week's Sedra, about Orla. When you come in to plant a tree, you cannot eat the fruit of that tree. And I've said this a couple of times because it's very relevant in Florida. People plant mango trees. When I bought my house, I had a mango tree in the garden. And I asked them, I said, when was this tree planted? It's important to know. Is this tree Orla? Is it in the first three years or not? So it's important halacha to know, but we're not going to discuss the intricacies of the halacha of Orla now. But basically, Orla is three years. Every three years, uh, the first three years of the fruit, you have to basically destroy it. You can't even sell it. You can't feed it to your animals. Forbidden. The fourth year, you take it to your shalim and you eat it. So nowadays we, we uh, exchange the holiness of the fruit onto a coin and we destroy the coin. We're not going into all the halachas now and then you can eat the fruit. And it occurred to me, it's very clear in halacha, these three years are not full years. These years are basically three Rosh Hashanahs. That means if I plant my tree at Pesach time, by the time it comes to Rosh Hashanah, six months later, it's already year one. So it doesn't have to be a full year. And the Gemara goes further to say, how much is the minimum of a year to be considered a year? 30 days. The expression of the Gemara is, 30 days is considered like a whole year. So practically you have to plant all of the 15th of Av because the Gemara says it takes two weeks for the tree to gain root. And once it gains root, it's considered a tree, and then you have 30 days. So practically, you have to plant it on the 15th of Av. But 30 days is considered a whole year. We have this in other areas of Halacha too. For example, when you buy a house, in the olden days, certainly you didn't keep your deeds. It was difficult. So they had this thing of Shalosh, Shonim is a chazoka. Three years you're living in a house and nobody's complained and kicked you out, that's already enough to establish that that house is yours. Somebody comes along and says, that's my house, what are you doing? You say, well, I've been here three years, you should have, you know, nobody lets you sit in the house three years uh, uh, and not complain. Again, there, there's this idea of, is this three years bang on to the day? No, it's years of Jewish years from Rosh Hashanah. And again, we have this expression, Shloshim Yom, 30 days is considered a year. As others have, how amazing is that? Shloshim Yom, one month is considered a whole year. So when it comes to Elul, we have this wonderful gift that Hashem has given us. Oops, breaking my whole house here. That if we are good in Elul, if we just take one month of the year and we express ourselves properly during davening, we learn Torah, we keep the mitzvahs like we should do, we do tshuva. We change our ways for one month. Chashim Kashana, 
is considered like the whole year. How amazing! It comes to Rosh Hashanah, and Hashem says, Oh, Rabbi Saunders. Well, he won't say Rabbi Saunders. I remember my Rav said, You know, he said at the end of Shemona Esra, people say Psukim uh, that start with the first letter of their name and end with the last letter because apparently that's supposed to help you remember your name after you die. And they say, What's your name? Because you're so old, God, uh, angel, you know, it's a bit of a frightening time, so you forget your name. So it's you remember these psukim and it remembers your name. I don't know if anybody says it. I say it. I see Arthur's nodding, so it looks like yeah, you know what it's about. So he used to say to me, he said, if you're a rob, you don't say a pasuk that starts with a rash and ends with a vase. You don't say a pasuk for rabbi. Or if you're dying, you don't say a pasuk for dying, do you? And even so, when somebody's ill, you don't say, even if it's a great rabbi, you don't say rabbi or anything like that. You don't say it because you just talk about the essence of a person. So if you won't say Rabbi Saunders, he'll say Saunders, right? Or you might say Arya Zave, Arya Zave when I'm wrong. I don't know. He'll say, oh, let's look at these books. Now, I've given a share last year, it's on YouTube, about how a Kaddish who just decides to judge our behavior on one day Rosh Hashanah, and I got a whole muscle and a whole thing, but we're not going to go into that now. So he'll say, oh, look at Elul. Oh, Elul, you did this? Ooh. Elo, you did that. Oh, you did this. You did that. Oh, you did this during Elo. Oh, you did it for one month. That's counted as if you did these mitzvahs the whole year. And it will look like I've got this amazing year. Ah, uh, this amazing year of mitzvahs and Torah and davening properly and thinking during davening and thinking during brachos and, 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 and I'm trying to learn a little bit more every day. Hashem will say, you did it for 30 days? Oh, you did it for the whole year. Look, you had a wonderful year. You did all these mitzvahs because 30 days is considered a year. So maybe that's this whole idea of Elo. Maybe that's this whole special thing of Elo. And if we just take one 30 days, I suppose I should give a disclaimer that you should be doing this the whole year round. But anyway, you take one set of 30 days and you work on yourself. You do the mitzvahs with more intensity. Because of course, we're all doing all the mitzvahs. Everybody's doing every mitzvah and davening and benching and, and saying brachos. Of course we are. And nobody's doing any averos. But we can do the mitzvahs with more intensity. We can do the mitzvahs with more feeling. Right? When we get out of bed, we say, oh, there's no shul. Ah, I'll daven in uh, my gym jams. I'll daven in my bare feet. No. Elul, we're going to daven in proper clothes. And we're going to daven with our shoes on. We're going to put our shoes. We're going to daven. We're going to make an effort. We're going to say, well, I'm at home. I'll skip some of the things. Nah. Hello, we're going to daven properly. We're going to make the benching. Normally, we bench and we're, on, uh, we're already on the beach somewhere. Our imagination's on the beach, right? No. We're going to make an effort. We're going to take a bench and we're going to sit. We're going to look inside. We're going to bench properly. And then Hashem will say, ooh, you've done a whole year of benching. You've done a whole year of davening with your clothes on properly, your shoes on, and doing it. Oh, what a wonderful person. And if you do it for 30 days, that's already like you've got a whole year. You, you, you've done it properly. And I'm just remembering now at the top of my head, I remember there's a Rambam somewhere that says, how do you break a habit? I think the Rambam says, if you do it consecutively for 30 days, if you do something that you're, you want to do, or you don't do something you're not supposed to do for 30 days, if my memory serves me correctly, it was the Rambam in Hilkos Deus. I said, once you've done it for 30 consecutive days, that sticks. That becomes uh, part of you. I have to try and find that for next time. Do you see this idea of 30 days? So if you take the opportunity in El, if you take the opportunity in El to really introspect and think about where you're headed, what you're going to do, what mitzvahs you're going to take on, how you're going to serve Hashem, then you do it for 30 days, that becomes who you are. That becomes ingrained in you. And Hashem says, ah, look, you've done this for the whole year. You've done this for the whole year. You've got all these mitzvahs. You've got all these merits. Oh, it's amazing. You didn't come to shul the whole year, but you came during Elul. Ah, oh, it's like you came the whole year. Of course, you should be coming every day. We'll be dominion every day. But that's the whole beauty and the whole simcha of Elul, what we can achieve, what we can work on in Elul. So I want to finish off with something practical, right? It's all very well, we hear Shiorim, we need to change. We need to... Practical, what should we do? So I'm thinking a lot, a lot, a lot about this. And then I found something in a Gusha newspaper. It made a big impression on me this afternoon. 
and uh, I said I was going to give another football and a soccer analogy. So just to set the scene for you, the captain of Manchester United Football Club, that's who I support, Harry Maguire, he was arrested in uh, a Greek island called Mykonos. I don't know if I pronounced it co correctly. Mykonos, Mykonos, I don't know. It's supposed to be a big party place. The season finished last Sunday, right? They lost in the semi-final, so big uh, stress. So he wanted a level of stress. He went to this place and was partying away. And then he was arrested. There's all sorts of rumors that he punched a policeman and he was fighting and then he tried to bribe the policeman. And he was arrested, spent two nights in jail, and he's got his big court case tomorrow. Right. So I saw in the Daily Mail, and if you ever heard of this newspaper, the Daily Mail, uh, British newspaper, I know they're very big online. An article I saw it a couple of hours ago. I thought, wow, we as Jews should do that article. You know what? Um, let me see if I can find this article because even just the headline of it, the headline of it is, uh, hold on. Uh, uh, hold on. Okay, so let me share my screen. Okay, so let's see what happens when I do this, right? Hello, everybody. Let's move this out of the way from my thing. Good, bye-bye. Right, Daily Mail. Let's see what happens when it comes up. I hope it's not gonna come with this whole nonsense with the mail in America at the moment. Okay, no. Let's go on to sports. Hold on. This was just so profound that I thought, oh, I have to share this in my Shia tonight. Written by a Goya by the Goya thing. Sports. No, what's happening? The Sutton is stopping us. Here we go. Can you see it on the screen? Harry Maguire, Martin Samuel. Harry Maguire only loses if he doesn't realize that every day at Manchester United is a win. David Beckham always knew when he won and celebrated accordingly. If you read this article, he goes on to say that why does he get himself into problems? Because he doesn't realize how lucky he is. Every day he should feel I'm a professional footballer. I'm happy to Manchester United. I'm earning millions. Here. Harry Maguire is in trouble for one simple reason. He does not know when he has won. And he has been winning for a long time. He won the day he signed his first professional contract. He won by winning right this whole thing. He goes on to say that you don't realize how lucky you are. Goes on. Every time one of these miles in a garage, he's living the dream that he would become a professional footballer and make a success of it, that he would play for his country and a huge crowd. Right? Tens of thousands would cheer his name. Hold on. Okay, adverts are starting. Right? And he goes on to say he doesn't realize how lucky he is. And I thought, ah, oh, that's what we need to feel as yet and every single day we have won. We are Jews. We have the opportunity to serve Hashem. We can do mitzvahs. We can get close to him. We can dab in Rosh Hashanah. We can crown him as our king. We have won every single day. We should wake up thinking, I have won. I'm so grateful to you, Malachi Mekayom. Right? We say at the end of learning. Oh, that's Okay, it's Right, every day we say at the end of davening, when we finish learning, every day we say, Hashem, thank you for making me a Jew. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to learn. And we need to think of that. That's the message. That's what I want to finish off the Shia with. That's what I want people to take away. That's what I want people to work on. That's what I want to challenge you all in this month of Elul to realize how lucky we are. Now, that goes on many levels. And the coronavirus has forced people to think what's really important in life, what's really special to them. But we are Jewish. We have the opportunity to serve our Kaddish Baruch I can take out a piece of a, a, a book. I can learn some Taylor. I can connect with Hashem. I can take out my Siddur. I can dive on his clothes. He feels me. He listens to me. Hashem Shima Bekoili, listen to my voice. I can turn to the creator of the world and say, listen to me. But I don't want him to listen to you. 
But listen to me. That's what the first thing we should work on. Because if we realize how lucky we are that we've won every single day, then the article went on to say he wouldn't have gone to these funny islands and got involved in these altercations because he would have realized I don't need to. I don't need to party to have a good time. I don't need to get involved because I'm already happy and warm because of this wonderful lifestyle God has given me. That's how we should feel, that we should feel proud and happy every single day that Hashem has made us a Jew. He's given us life, he's given us the ability and we need to use it. And on that message, uh, I know we normally like to wait and finish off questions, but tonight, it's, uh, in a few minutes, the Rabbinical Alliance of America, which I am a member, have got their pre-Rosh Hashanah conference. Uh, and the guest, main guest speaker, they have three guest speakers, so I think I'm in for a long night, uh, is Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, my former boss. So he's giving one of the, uh, he's the first uh, guest speaker and, and so on. So I have to, uh, I don't want to miss that. So uh, on, on that note, I wish everybody, let me stop the recording.